Hello, good morning. Thank you for your time, first and foremost. Thanks to David for inviting me here. Uh, I know everyone's really busy, so I do appreciate you listening to me. So Stephen English, Blankstone Sington is my firm. 2002, I joined, so man and boy, same firm. Uh, I am 37, believe it or not. People do think I look 28, but I am 37. And I've been fortunate enough, in a small firm, you get to wear many hats. So as well as doing large cap, mid cap, got into small cap investing, but also uh, research fund managers and get to interview fund managers. So investment trusts and unit trusts. So I have, I've had thousands of meetings. Being in Liverpool is actually a really good place. We do get the best, the worst, the most mediocre. I've pretty much seen every fund manager and I've had an hour of their time. Uh, so that's very, very fortunate. So a bit of poacher turn gamekeeper. So then since 2010, I've been running our AMIHT portfolio at Blankstone Sington. And as good as the meetings were, a lot of them started to merge and blend into one. You could replace the brand of the firm house and the process was pretty much much of a muchness. It was very, very identical. There was a homogeneity to the process. And we buy quality, we buy low debt, we buy good management. And this was repeat, 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 and that's fine. And we do have a core of that, but the more re work I did on this myself away from that, uh, the more I realized there was much, much more to it and it's much more nuanced than that. Any strategy that works in the market should ultimately be self-defeating. If it's good, there should be a core tenant why it's good. And if it's good, people will start to follow it and fund flows change factors. If you've got something that worked when no one knew that it worked and there was only maybe 10 million quid in that strategy, fine. As soon as some factor or quant works it out and two billion pounds goes into that, you have killed and blunted that factor and you need to move on. Markets are complex adaptive beasts. They are world-class at defying what you think is right and confounding as many people as possible for as much as the time. So you've got to constantly evolve your thinking. So I'll take you some of my, through some of my thinkings now. It's kind of a elaborate version of my investment philosophy. This thing took 200 hours for 12 pages of my deepest, darkest thoughts. It's on, my web, on the website of Blankstone Singleton if you'd like to download it. Everyone's got a book in them. They say, mine can stay in me. That took 200 hours, awful. So that, if you ever get up to Liverpool, this is Crosby Beach, Anthony Gormley, uh, another place is this sculpture. Uh, dozens and dozens of these iron men on the beach. So we use this quite a lot. It does remind me of the Reginald Perrin beach scene though. I'm feeling a bit suicidal, but it's not the case. Uh, the hilarity that David alluded to, uh, unfortunately that has been chopped out by my compliance department. Uh, so if I'm not funny, it's their fault, uh, not mine. A good way to, is, I always like to take a step back when you're thinking about stock market and investing, really there's only three components that make up your total return over the longer term. And you can finesse this, you can change this to earnings growth rather than dividend growth or free cash flow, but I always prefer to keep things very, very simple, which you'll see shortly, but your total return in equities is driven by your starting dividend yield, your dividend growth thereafter, and any change plus or minus in the PE ratio. That's it. Long term, this is the formula Jack Bogle uses, the founder of Vanguard, and it does work as a really good rule of thumb. So back in 2010, when I was putting the portfolio together initially, the PE was below 10, dividend yields were probably 3%, and we were getting 15, 20% per annum dividend growth. So dividend yield three plus 20, that's 23% you're expecting. And the P's were great to start off and now we've re-rated 80% and that explains all of the returns. So starting P's today are more like 16. So it's gonna be harder to make the same amount of returns we did since 2010. I'm gonna get less help, I would suspect, from the P ratio. Where I do think I'll still get continued help is the dividend growth AIM companies in particular, and they're in a sweet spot. If you look for the highest total returning stocks, it's stocks that have a dividend yield of between two and 4% and where the payout ratio is quite low because not paying out too much of their earnings, they can grow those dividend payments by double digit. And long-term, if your PE doesn't change, that will drag up a share price with you. So this is always a nice frame of reference for you. 
And over five years, the PE will dictate about 40% of your returns for zero. So it is important to get a handle on what you think the PE is going to do. Long term, over 10 years, 60% of your returns will come from dividend growth, 6-0. 20% will come from your dividend yield. So over 10 years, 80% of your returns will come from dividend start and yield and dividend growth. So pick those companies that are gonna be growing the dividends, even if they're not paying one today, hopefully in the near future, next 12, 18 months in particular, I look at ideally they're paying a dividend today, but it can turbocharge your performance. So we spoke about simplicity and the more work I've done on this and it's tens of thousands of hours now, I am a student of the markets. I don't have a TV at home. When I get in, I have my tea and then I'm reading, I'm reading blogs. I'm quite a late night reader and then bedtime. And then when the commute starts, I'll put a podcast on an hour for that hour driving home. So that's two hours on the podcast. This is a passion of mine and I, it's almost a hobby but I get paid for it, and that's absolutely wonderful. If you enjoy your work, you never work a day in your life. And I think it's very humbling that people trust their money to me. I don't think there's any better thing in life than that. And I'm truly appreciative of that. But on the simplicity side, everything should be made as simple as possible, not, not simpler. This is one of the greatest ways to avoid trouble. The rule of parsimony. If you want to get very clever, the mathematics call it Occam's razor. The supposition with the fewest assumptions is generally the more robust. If you've got a formula with 20 variables in it, likely you've overfitted the data. You've looked at previous patterns, what worked previously, you've figured out a formula, and then bang, all of a sudden markets change, correlation goes from minus one to one, and all of that is gone. Keep things simple. There's only four or five things you need to get right for an investment to make good, good money. It's a bit like the Pareto rule, the 80-20 rule. You only need 20% of the things that, that, that can affect an investment. Get those 20% right, and that'll be 80% of your, your performance. But it's only up to a point. So this is taken from the parable there, the, the blind men trying to figure out what they were feeling there. Uh, is an elephant. One guy thinks it's a rope a tree, depending on which part you are groping at and that's investment you only ever get to touch maybe the leg the tail the body you only get little snippets of an investment and you've got to try and extrapolate that into the whole we're never fortunate enough to see the whole elephant when it comes to investing only the ceo and the cfo sees the whole elef elephant we can only pass certain information from little tidbits that we get given but don't extrapolate from limited data too much. You can get erroneous outcomes. People conflate a great company being a great investment, and that's nonsense. Many of you remember the Nifty 50 uh, back in America, late 60s, 70s. No company is so good that it can't be bid up to a certain point uh, where it turns sour. Risk is primarily a function of price. You can have high quality assets that are risky if you overpay for them. You can have low quality assets that are safe if you underpay for them. This is why investment starts to get a little bit wonky and you need to invert your thinking. Popular stocks, what you're doing there, you're elevating your risk and you're also reducing your future returns. A lot of those returns have already been brought forward. And efficient markets, they're sometimes efficient, sometimes they're not, but people think efficiency means rational, and they're not rational. Markets are wholly irrational, and that's where there's a lot of money to be made. In poker, the expression, if you don't realize who the fish is, you are the fish. Please don't be the fish. Please be a superior investor, and don't get caught out in markets. My creed that sounds quite grandiose, but it is a core set of beliefs. And first one, and it is number one for a reason, the Hippocratic Oath there, as a doctor first, do no harm. What I mean by that is you've got a portfolio and the portfolio is bobbling along very nicely and then you get a little bit trigger happy and giddy. Let's add a stock or let's sell a stock. Sometimes you do it out of boredom. Please don't do that. Only do things for the right reasons. Second, the only time I'll quote Tony Blair, what matters is what works. And this is perhaps what sets me apart from a lot of the more institutional fund managers. 
I use the analogy difference between a street footballer and a academy footballer. I don't think you're going to get another Gaza or a George Best now the way the football system's set up. Seven years old, the child goes into the academy and they are coached to death. They are solid players at the end of it, but that flair, that ambition to do things differently, it's coached out of you. So I'm trying to become more of a street footballer or a street investor. All I'm bothered about is what works. How can I make money for my clients? There's a lot of intellectuals in the market who look for things to be absolutely perfect or they fear to tread or fear to buy some investment because they fear of looking foolish or they need to window dress the portfolio at the end of the quarter because it's an absolute dog and they don't want it anywhere near there when they have to send the fact sheet out. Not concerned with any of that. If the risk stacks up for the reward, and it might be a one-year one trade, if there's a, a reason why I believe I can make a significant amount of money, I will do it. I'm not too proud to be in and out of something. Some of my stocks have held for seven, eight years plus. Others I'll hold for two years or 18 months. You don't get more kudos for owning a stock for 10 years. Money is money at the end of the day. What matters is what works. I'm singularly focused on that. And the third one is an oxymoron, and there's many oxymorons in the markets. Strong opinions, weakly held. So what the hell do I mean about that? What I've realized, the more work I've done on this one, what sets the great investors apart from the truly great investors is this interplay between having conviction on the one hand, but flexibility on the other. You can't have conviction that it's so strong that it's immutable. It has to be changeable if the facts change. You might have bought a stock and a week later something's happened. That may have been a faulty analysis, in which case hold your hand up and sell it and move on. Or it may have been some exogenous shock that you had no control over and that was unforecastable. It may mean that you have to move on as well. It's this interplay between having the conviction to hold on the one hand but knowing when to give up. The first loss is the best loss when it comes to investing. That's why I never fall in love with your stocks. I see stocks as like a chariot rider. Stocks are just the horses pulling my chariot up a hill. If a stock, if a horse pulls up lame, take him out, pass him off. There's many people who take over a lame horse for you and look after them and nurture them, hope that they turn back to a racehorse. Invariably, they end up as a burger. <laughs> Replace them with a, a new stallion, and that's all you're doing, constantly putting your best ideas to drive that chariot forward. So I'm going to discuss now parts or tenants of my investment process. Everyone in this room should have an investment process. You probably do, and you don't realize it. If you don't, please stop investing immediately and get an investment process and then return to the market. A lot of the investment processes look something like the diagram there, the Venn diagram. That is not a strategy or a process or a philosophy. And I use the word philosophy and process interchangeably. It's absolutely vital for your long-term success in investment. I call it a compass, a map, and a warm blanket to sleep well at night. It forms a key part of the process. But there's a key difference here. A lot of people are focused on outcomes rather than the process. And we'll come on to that in a second. If, as it stands today, you PLC, would you buy you if you were a stock? Yes, no, or hold. If you wouldn't buy you as a stock, when I say, if you don't think you're a good enough investor that you, if you were a stock, you'd buy yourself, then you need to upgrade this investment process. And you have to focus on the process, not the outcome. This is a famous matrix taken from Michael Malberson. Uh, he's turned up all sorts. He's a brilliant brilliant writer of markets. If you don't follow Michael Malberson, please do. There's extensive papers out there. Reading those papers is half dozen. The seminal papers, they will help you no end. You can have a good process, but a bad outcome, the top right quadrant, and that's just a bad break. If you've got a good, pro good process, the good outcomes will come eventually, and that is deserved success. If you've got a bad process, you can get a good outcome and people think wonderful that you may get one two or three of them you repeat this long enough if you've got a bad process you'll get more bad outcomes and good outcomes 
and that is poetic justice in many respects. What we're trying to do here with the process is giving you an edge. Everyone needs an edge or you shouldn't be in the market. Over time, a good progress process will assert itself on your performance. Most fund managers can't focus on this process because there's other considerations that they take into account. Career risk is a massive one and because there are they are more focused on relative performance rather than absolute performance. Thankfully, um, closeted from that relative performance fixation. There's some fund managers I know get daily stats on how they've performed to their peer group. Imagine having a daily ready reckoner, you're outperformed that day or you underperformed that day. This will mess up any investment process. This turns you into a short-term performance chaser. The way you need to view investing, I believe, is a, it is a probabilistic endeavor. What you're trying to do when you're looking at a price you need to tease out the price with the expectation that's baked into the price. The way I look at it, it's a decent way of looking at it, is if you can think or you can identify a horse that is really a 50 to 1 chance, but it's priced at 100 to 1, you will make that bet every day. A 50 to 1 priced horse implies a 2% chance of winning. So you're not putting the bet on because you expect it to win in that single outcome. If you do a 1,000 of those bets you will make a tremendous amount of money because you are buying it at 50 to, you're buying a horse at 50 to one. The real probability is 50 to one, but it's priced at 100 to one. It's underpriced in effect. You keep doing that, that's having a good process, that's having a good edge, and that will deliver strong returns for you. It's price versus expectation. Another slight oxymoron, to make money, you have to take losses. Please do learn from other mistakes that others have made. There's enough books out there. You don't have to do them yourself, but they are valuable and you will have to make your own mistakes when it comes to investing. If I was a war veteran, I would be adorned with all sorts of medals for my gallantry in losing. I have made all sorts of mistakes and that is the cost of the education to get to where I am today. Thankfully, it hasn't been too costly or I wouldn't be standing here today, but it is a cost. You have to pay. You do have to take losses. If you only wanted to sell every portfolio holding on a profit, you are going to suffer immeasurable opportunity cost. If you buy at a quid and it goes down to 90p and you want to, you want to sell it if it gets to 105 and you won't sell it until you get to a small profit, 10 years later you've eked out, it's gone to 105, you sold it, you've made 5% in 10 years. You could have took that 90 pence in the meantime and stuck it into a stock that's gone up 100%. The first loss is the best loss, to repeat myself. Take the losses early on. If the things change or your capital can be used elsewhere better or your conviction's gone on the stock a little bit, move on, recycle into something you've got higher conviction on. Smart people do dumb things all the time in markets. Sometimes it's not their fault. Fund managers, to a large extent, suffer from the puppet master. The puppet master are retail investors investing in a unit trust who throw money at them after they've had a big uprise and then take the money after markets have started to crash. Fund managers are forced sellers in that instance. It looks stupid. They're having to sell some of the best stocks. They sell the most liquid stocks first and then the less liquid eventually has to get sold as well. You can take advantage of that. Try to win by not losing overall. Howard Marks, who founded Oak Tree, one of my investment heroes, he believes that Investment is judged more by the badness of your losers rather than the goodness of your winners. Think of it another way is the best films out there have a cutting room full of deleted scenes. You can make money by avoiding losing money. It's negative screening by sidestepping a lot of these IPOs when most of them are actually rubbish. Have such a high hurdle rate for your requirement for you to invest. And sometimes it is easier to spot losers than it is the winners. In 1905, there was 20 million horses in the USA. Then the motor car started. And Warren Buffett uses this analogy. From 20 million horses, there's now 4 million horses in the US. The motor car wasn't terribly friendly to the horse. Short the horse. If there was a mechanism to short the horse, you would have made a lot of money. The motor car, that was all whizzy and new. Unfortunately, there's been 2,000 car manufacturers in the US. And today, as we know, there's less than a handful left standing. Try and pick the winners out of those 2,000 ones that were listed on the stock market. Impossible. 
What you could have identified is the farriers, uh, the blacksmiths, well, they're on a sticky wicket, sell out of them. Let's let the sector calm down and then we'll pick the winners thereafter. It's sometimes it's the second mouse that gets the cheese, if you think of it that way. Sometimes it's not first mover advantage. Sometimes it pays just to be a little bit more circumspect. This is a nice phrase that I nicked some somewhere off the internet. Successful investing is having everyone agree with you, dot, 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 later. And that's what it's all about. You've got to be early on a trade for there to be value in the trade. You can't be too early because that's imperceptibly different from being wrong. Nor can you be in a stock that you think and believe is absolutely a wonderful bargain if after five or ten years no one else agrees with you. Opportunity cost again. It's been stale, parked money. An analogy I use, Ronnie O'Sullivan, best snooker player probably that's ever lived. He thinks two or, she, two or three shots ahead when he's making his break. To build a big break, he has to think two or three shots ahead. Please do that with your investments as well. Invert logic all the time. If the price is high, then everyone's very bullish about the stock. Why is everyone bullish about the stock? What new reasons can you think of that aren't in the price? It becomes very, very hard. Start to think of it in those terms. Invert it. So 2010, I bought BT for clients, and then we sold it in 2016. We rolled it very well. It was a mutually assured destruction strategy for a time with its TV rights that it was bidding up against Sky, going higher and higher and higher. The reason I sold it is the PE re-rated very nicely. The pension deficit was fine. We had bond yields sort that out for them. Markets, equity markets rose as well. But the CEO of a FTSE 100 company is largely a politician. Their tenure is going to be three, four, five years. What they should have done rather than spending money on TV rights was to upgrade the fiber optic network. The guy now who's just left this week, he's reaped what the previous CEO sown. Same thing at Tesco. They would become an increasing conglomerate. They bought Dobby's Garden Center. No idea why Tesco bought Gobby, Dobby's Garden Center. I had a heated exchange with the FD of Tesco in 2010, telling him that the world had changed. You're going to have to scrap over every pound. And he turned around to me and said, I don't think a price war is in anyone's interests, Sonny. He didn't say Sonny, but that was his intonation and his tone. And I remember 91, 92, and there was a price war when Gateway uh, got into a little bit of a strife. And what I realized then, they were so far gone in going into America, they couldn't admit. America probably would have been a good idea if you didn't have a credit crunch, but the credit crunch changed the American expansion for Tesco. They had invested too much capital, but also intellectual capital to turn around and say, we are pulling out. Then it takes a change of people. So start to think, start to think ahead, two shots ahead. If people are too bullish or the P has gone from 10 to 20, what's going to happen next? That starts to put your head off the crowd. The way I think about investing, I think the, the predominant consideration you need to get correct is psychological. 30% of it I view as quantitative. This is being very good at reading the accounts, the income statement, the balance sheet, the cash flow statement should all tell you the same thing. That's great. You need to be very good at that. And profit isn't a profit unless it throws off cash. Qualitative is the bit more touchy-feely, ephemeral bits. It's what the industry structure looks like, what's management the quality of them, what skin in the game do they have, but 40% of it is psychological. You'll never get to know an investment. You'll never really know an investment. It goes back to the elephant. We'll never really see the elephant. What you need to do is try and get as many insights into it as possible. I liken it from, if you, get, if you just look at an investment, look at the chart, well, that's probably akin to a radio. If you look at it a bit deeper in terms of financials, you're getting a TV there. You go deeper and deeper, you become a color TV, a HD TV. If you can become good enough at investing, it becomes like a virtual reality. You see a lot more of the investments. But humans do dominate. Psychology will always be very, very important. Fear and greed is a pendulum that's always moving and it never stops. And trying to gauge where we are in markets is very important. It can save you a lot of money. Sticking with the psychological, Reality isn't reality when it comes to investing. Perception is reality. This is the famous sketch from Blackadder when Blackadder spat out his coffee and said it tastes like mud and Baldrick told him it's because it is mud. He ran out of coffee 18 months ago. 
Only when did he realize he, it was mud, the perception had changed. He perceived it to be coffee, so it was coffee, until the reality that it was mud became mud. A lot of people obsess over the E when we talk about the PE. They always try and forecast what the E is going to do in five or 10 years' time. Your returns are entirely driven by the P side of it, though. And this is where the psychological element comes into it and trying to think two shots ahead. The last 10 years have been dominate, dominated by valuation change. Our P has gone up. People are paying a lot more for the same amount of earnings. We're not going to get that same benefit again. It's going to be a lot harder to make the amount of money that we've made previously. Not impossible, but I think the super normal returns that we have had, don't confuse yourself. That heavy listing has been done just because the PE has gone up. But perception reality, if a company is perceived to be weak, it's weak. The share price will reflect that perception. Don't fight it. Don't argue it. Don't get upset. Recognize what the perception in the market is and be the right side of that trade. I was had a lot of fund managers are either growth or value investors, and I think that's a false dichotomy. I think it's two sides of the same coin. I like to try and maintain a foot in both camps because no one can time when value is going to outperform growth. Value, I say, is more about the current. It's about asset values trying to buy a quid for 50 pence. You try and buy on the assets and sell on the earnings. Growth investing is a lot more about thinking about the future. Where is the company going to be in five years, 10 years' time? and then looking at that price today. So you might be paying two pound for one pound of assets, but you expect those pounds to grow. To my mind, both aim to buy below intrinsic value. So I don't think it's good enough for a value investor to say, I've had a shocking time since 2009. Not my fault, my style isn't in vogue. When all the other growth investors have made absolute hay. That's why I do like a balance. I view things much more through the prism of the peg ratio. What growth are you getting for the P that you're paying? And the PEG is a really, really powerful tool, and I do use it a lot. So now we'll come on to some performance enhancers, hopefully, that you can take away for your own portfolio. If you do test positive for these supplements, you won't get banned from investing, I promise you. Moat. If there's a bubble in the word moat at the moment. Everyone's saying moat, moat, moat. But, and I don't like things that are too popular. I'm just naturally don't like it, but it is very, very true. Moat is what we mean. We talk about competitive advantage, and I was doing a lot of work on this, and there's very, very few people who will tell you how to ever identify a competitive advantage or actually measure it. You'll never know or you'll never see in plain sight what a company's competitive advantage is. You can only deduce it in the same way that people can only discover a new planet when it passes through a passes a star and it dims the star's light. You can only infer that there's a planet there. And that's what we're trying to do. We're inferring this competitive advantage. What you want to know is, what is the competitive advantage? Because that does drive sustainable value creation. And that's what we're all about. It does need constant attention by management and adroit capital allocation from the CEO. What you want to assess is how much and how long how much economic profit can they earn for how long? And a good way of testing this, whether they have a moat or not, and this is mathematical and very doable, two tests, is their return above the cost of capital? Is their rocky above the whack? Test number one. And test number two, their return must be higher than their peer group. If it isn't higher than their peer group, they're the same as their peers. There's no competitive advantage there. So they're a two tiered test, really, really strong takeaway. And it is very, very closely related that to pricing power. Pricing power, to use Buffett, no talk is complete without a Buffett quote. Single most important decision in, val in evaluating a business is pricing power. But if it was that straightforward, you'd buy a company that's raised its prices for the last 20 years, thinking and extrapolating that it'll always be able to rise, raise its prices. One thing you need to get is is we're only bothered about real price rises, not nominal price rises. If inflation's 10% and it's sticking its price up 5%, that's not terribly clever. If inflation's 10% and it's sticking its price up 15%, that's potentially clever. So that's consideration number one. But there is a limit. Pricing power is finite. It doesn't matter how good your business is, it is finite. And you can poison the well if you are too egregious with your price gouging. You only need to look at Gillette, 
dignity recently. They kept hiking and hiking the price of the funeral up. And then all of a sudden, price and comparison website comes out and they just lost a bucket load of market share, massive diminution of your shareholder capital. Gillette now, uh, Dollar Shave Club came from nowhere. Before YouTube came out, Dollar Shave Club could not have happened. Gillette's moat was a billion dollar advertising budget and shelf space. Then YouTube came out and all of a sudden you've got 7 billion audience and it's free essentially. So Dollar Shave Club came out with a funny advert and them and Harry's have now taken 20% plus market share within a few years. Gillette now are trying to collapse their pricing on their razor blades. It's probably too late for them. They've poisoned the well. Years of price declines may actually set the stage for pricing power. So don't always look for companies that have increased prices in perpetuity, expecting that to continue. And the graph on the right is railroad pricing in America, stretching back to 1965. In real terms, the cost of transit fell and fell and fell and fell. It was an awful industry, no pricing power there at all. What happened though, that was storing up, that was creating this latent tension and pricing power. Mr. Buffett bought his train set, Santa Fe, in 2009, I think largely because he'd seen this turn in pricing power. He's obsessed with it. So when we talk about moats, that's what we're looking for, pricing power. We're also looking for high return companies, high return on capital employed, but you need to differentiate. There's two different companies. There's a Coca-Cola that will earn 20% return on capital employed that can't reinvest those earnings to grow its moat. It can't compound them. Coke is Coke. It's got, it's all in all places it's going to be. So it pays most of that away. And there's nothing wrong with that. The best companies for you to make five or 10 times your money are those companies that can reinvest that incremental capital at that very high return on capital employed. That's when you're compounding. You get your 30%, you generate capital, stick it in a bigger business, still generating 30%, still generating 30%. And you're doubling every three, two and three years for your shareholders. One thing I do look for is gross profitability divided by total assets. I'll concentrate first on the nu numerator, the gross profitability side. The total assets I'll come on to because that's vital as well. This was a study by Novi March. He split up world's equities into quintiles. And if you invested in the highest quintile, where you had the highest gross profitability divided by total assets, that was the blue dotted line. Compare that to the lowest quintile that had the lowest gross profit as a proportion of their total assets, and they hugely underperform the market. So gross profit is very, very important. I like it because it's the purest measure of profit. You can compare two companies which have got the highest gross margin, that's probably a better company. What this also helps you out with is an Amazon situation. In 2015, the price earnings ratio of Amazon was 540 times because they were investing a lot into their business and they were taking huge costs down into the P&L. So their bottom line earnings were way for thin. The price earnings ratio was sky high. At the top line, their gross profits, because they were quite a capital light business, so they didn't have that much total assets, they were generating a 50% return on their total assets. And anything above 33% is viewed as being in a good space and good quality. So on that measure, Amazon screened incredibly highly and potentially it would have put you into Amazon. Something I'm very sensitive as well is when gross margins, so gross profits as a percent of sales, when your gross margins declines and if it's out the blue. So if you look at dignity again, you will see years gross margin appreciation and then one year bang, and then it all started to go wrong for them. Animal Care is a pharmaceutical company. They referenced falling gross margins, share price gone from £4.50 to £1.70. Conviviality, topical, used to own Conviviality, owned it for years, bought it originally for bargain booze because I thought the consumer was under a bit of pressure since 2010, disposable income's tight, et cetera, et cetera. They couldn't add up. They forgot they owed the taxman 30 million quid. But for my mind, because I, I was going to sell them at four pounds, but because I'm an IHT investor, I can't be sat in cash and I didn't have a reinvestment at that point. I wanted to sell them at four pounds, not because I had a price target. I don't use price targets, 
they create a false anchor. Because you might, your E, you don't know what your E is going to be and you don't know what the P E is going to be at that point. Your E might be bigger. And if you've got a price target, it's a wrong way of doing it. What I think is what PE would I prefer to sell out on? Conviviality is a distributor. It distributes, it buys alcohol off the Argio and sells it to Weatherspoons. That's as clever as conviviality was. It's a distributor and its margins were low to reflect that. But it went up to a PE of 19 times. There was a certain investor that popped up on the register who's very involved in my space and they are a griller. And I love it when they appear on my register because that's me heading towards the exit because you start to see the PE ratio inflate before your eyes. Conviviality should never have been on a P of 19. It was a low growth distributor. So I couldn't sell it at four quid. When it got to three quid, then he have a slight profit warning. This was before everything started, before the wheels came off. The profit warning, they reference falling margins. And that's not what the CEO told me when I had her in the office 12 months before that. And I was also concerned at the cash generation of the company and the fact that they had, there was a number of senior managers deserted a sinking ship. One guy in particular who was being groomed as the next CEO left all of a sudden. You don't, you don't, you don't hear of these senior manager departments departures because they're not directors, but there was a raft of them. They saw the writing on the wall. But in January, they said margins are coming under pressure. What the CEO told me is because they were so big, they had massive bulk buying power from the likes of Diageo. But what transpired is Weatherspoons had more pricing power over them than they had over Diageo. So they negotiated a long-term contract. And for me, as soon as I saw that, I sold. I sold to some other investors that I found out, some big institutions. They probably sold at four quid and because it fell to 280. And I actually sold at 280. I was waiting for a bounce and it never came. And I was too nervous about it, so I sold. I didn't think they were going bust, don't get me wrong. Uh, but gross margin, if you're going to overreact to anything in the stock market, gross margin. Don't ask your barber if you want a haircut. Don't ask a CEO if things are becoming too competitive. They will never admit it. They're either disingenuous or they can't admit it to themselves. Look at the figures. Don't look at the narrative. Never look at the blurb, the verbiage in an RNS or a results announcement. Only concentrate on the figures. Some of the best companies I target, I look at market share in relative terms, not absolute terms. If you've got a massive difference between you and the second, what this creates is this virtuous flywheel. You've got a superior product, gets more customers, higher sales than the next guy. You've got a higher R&D budget to innovate and make your superior product even more so. It puts clear water between you. Whereas if, you, if, you're, the, if you're the biggest, but you're 10% and the next biggest is 9%, there's not enough difference there. You are both going to be investing a lot of your R&D just to stand still. So concentrate on companies that are relatively the gorilla in the market. Another strategy I employ is value with momentum. I love value investing. It's very hard to do though. And there's an opportunity cost in value investors get in early after it's had the down leg and then normally have to sit through years of pain and further falls and you have to be brave enough to buy more on weakness. Well, I don't want that. There's no kudos for buying the very bottom tick of a share price. 50% profit to 50% profit. I don't care if we get it in the middle part of a trend or in the fag ends of the trend. I'd rather make 50% in two years than 100% over 10 years. So if you ally, you know something's cheap, don't buy it yet. Wait for it to turn, wait for earnings momentum to come in. You'll pay a bit more for it, but things have shifted. You're no longer pushing on a closed door, you're pushing on an open door. Like trying to get up a slope with skis on. Use a lift to get yourself up there. That's what a share price and earnings that are pointing upwards will help you no end. It's like a tanker. Share price trends persist. It's so hard to turn that tank around. People need to be disgusted with the stock. The last seller needs to exit that market. And it takes ages, a lot longer than people think. So this shows you if you use value momentum, which is the top, the purple line, outperforms value, which is the blue line, has outperformed uh, growth, the very bottom line there. The two of the most powerful factors around. So please make use of them. And the founder's mentality. I prefer companies that have significant skin in the game. This was a study that looked at where the founders still involved in S&P companies. They outperform by three times the market. All sorts of reasons why. Alignment of interest, long-term focus, etc., cetera, et cetera. I had a company, K3 Capital, 
they were moaning that the annual report was going to cost them £50,000. They still owned a big chunk of this business. They had the owner's eye, so they did the annual report themselves. They could because of the kind of the produced marketing documents themselves. Love to hear that. If he's so bothered, this is this this business making millions of profits. He's so bothered about avoiding a fifty thousand pound cost they did it themselves. If this is a CEO of a FTSE one hundred company, he could not or she could not give a monkeys about a fifty grand cost. If they care so much about the little things, then they obviously care about the big things. Capital cycle, very important, and this is an anomaly, and a lot of people don't appreciate it. The industries that have had the highest asset growth, so you've had M&A, you've had fundraising, you've had debt, underperformed. That's the left-hand one there. The industries that have had the lowest asset growth, and probably where assets have been contracting because it's been awful, actually deliver the highest investment returns. And that wrecks your head in many respects. It's kind of contrary to what you think. Firms with the highest asset growth deliver the lowest returns. This is people who are building empires. They are focused on growing their market cap, but not their share price. So look for industries that have been contracting. And this is where, this is, a, this is concentrating on the supply side. And this is a lot easier to see coming. If you remember the miners in 2007, you would have sidestepped a lot of that because you can see supply coming years. And the change in the supply of an industry affects things a lot more than the change in demand very often. Whereas a lot of an investors and analysts concentrate on trying to forecast demand. Be aware of the industry cycle. New entrants come into it. They're attracted by the high returns. Competition goes up. Share prices underperform. Then the returns fall below the cost of capital. Investors exit. People exit. Businesses exit. They close down. Then there's an improving supply side, and it starts again. Coming in when it's just on that left one is very, very important. People always overreact and think it's going to carry on. So when you're at, well, if, if you're a value or a growth investor, it's necessary to take into account asset growth, supply asset growth in your industry at both the company level and also the sector level. You might love your company, but if that sector has seen massive asset growth over the last five years, I tend to avoid it. It will be caught up in it at some point. Won't, won't dwell on them too long. Spoke about gross margin. The only one I'd like to highlight in particular, um, whenever you see a company or a CEO raise the sign, strategic review, may sell ourselves, head for the hills. The share price normally goes up 10%. Sell it to people who are buying it because they think a bid's coming. The fact they have to hoist a for sale sign up means that they're pretty rubbish. I spoke to a CEO and he said, if someone comes to me wanting to sell something to me, I don't want to buy it. The CEO only approaches companies he wants to buy that aren't for sale. Move on. Wish, wish I followed this advice for WYG several years ago. They did that exact same thing. It happens time and time again. IPOs, don't touch most of them. It's probably overpriced as a better acronym. The one thing to look for in an IPO, long on prospects, short on capital. They're the best ones. They've got a really strong product. They've run out of cash. They need the cash to meet this excess demand. They're the ones I've done since 2014. So I've only done 3% of all AIM IPOs. I've sidestepped 97% of them. Acrol, you may want to ask me a question on that one. Down 77. The rest, thankfully, all triple digit. I am very, very, very selective. And there is a core theme through all of those ones. A lot of my peers don't touch IPOs because they're scared of them. That's music to my ears. If a lot of my peers aren't involved in that, likely the price is wrong and there's an opportunity for me. Stock example, Alpha FX. Owners found their own a business, provides foreign exchange to companies who can't afford their own treasury department. You look at the profit margins, wonderful. You don't really see these 97% retention rate, checked it with a FTSE 250 company who used them. One employee stuck £100,000 of his own money into the IPO. He wasn't a director. They raised £11.8 million. They wanted to triple the size of their forward order book in FX. You need capital to back that. Triple the size of it. That's why they raised the capital. Unique culture. And I could spend an hour talking about culture. And if you don't have the right culture in the business, you're not going to go anywhere fast. It was significantly oversubscribed. Dozen investors received zero allocation. We got 25% of our allocation at 196. It opened up 10%. We kept buying. We, we filled our order on the day one. 64 mil market cap. Too small for a lot of my peers. 
but now it's 193 million pounds. You need to learn also what can't be taught. There's a lot, that's intuition, that's pattern recognition. It's because I've spent thousands and tens of thousands of hours looking at this. I use an analogy, there was a fireman who pulled his men out of a kitchen. Seconds later, the floor collapsed. There was a decision maker expert who went and asked him why he did that and he didn't know himself. So this decision maker spent two years figuring it out. One, the fire was hotter than it should have been. It was quieter than it should have been and the water wasn't putting it out. It's because the fire wasn't in the kitchen, it was in the basement. The fireman put all of these together unconsciously, got his men out there. Learn what can't be taught. These are only tidbits, but you have to make this investment process yourself and it has to suit your personality. If you're looking for questions for management, if you ever get to interview them, there are perhaps some good ones. I'd pick on one that actually flummoxed them, the last one there. What trade-offs are inherent, inherent within your strategy? Every strategy's got a trade-off. You could grow quicker, but you might be increasing your risk. Or you might want to give more service, but then that's going to increase the price you have to charge for them. There's trade-offs with every strategy, and some of them can't answer it at all well. Another good one is what are your key assumptions? You might think they're nonsense. They might assume the market's going to grow at 10% and it's only growing at 2%. Why are they assuming it at 10%? There's only, the only stupid question is the question never asked. And I'm very comfortable now asking very, very simple questions because they're often the most revealing. Pull that all together, finish up on this. I'm not bothered about this. Please don't look at this. If you're picking a fund manager, put this only as 20% of your consideration past performance. Thankfully, it's done okay. Compared to the old companies that are over five years will be in the top 3%. That's great, that's wonderful. I'm more bothered whether, if I can sustain that. If you're an investor in a fund manager, what you should be bothered with is if that investor's fund manager process is repeatable, is it sustainable? This might have been dumb luck, it's only five years, and it could have been a lot of luck in there, we don't know yet. 10 years, you'll start to get a better picture whether there's any sort of alpha ability within me or not. So please don't chase performance. Nearly everyone chases performance. I call it the here's what you could have won. It's when Jim Bowen wheeled the speedboat out on bullseye. Here's what you could have won. That's what past performance is. Forget about it, it's gone. They might have took the most risk. They might have bought the junkiest stocks. Their, their style might have been in vogue for that particular market. And finish up with some things that you should absolutely must read. Against the gods, I've got, a massive I've got a massive issue with risk being viewed as volatility. It isn't. It's sometimes related, but sometimes it's not even the second or third cousin relation to risk. Volatility is more aligned to liquidity. Against the gods will tell you everything about risk. Risk comes from the Italian word, riscare. Riscare, I just want to do that again. I like that. And riscare means to dare which is ironic because risk now is something that everyone is frightened of. You won't get any upside unless you embrace the downside. That is a brilliant book. Howard Marks, read everything that he's written. He releases memos, put yourself on that as well. And when genius failed, this will teach you everything about how very, very bright people from MIT can do stupid things by blowing themselves up with leverage. Essential reading, these are the blogs that I'm reading at nighttime. These are all free. FT Alphaville is a wonderful resource. Abnormal returns would possibly be better. This is a curator of all the best stories, the best bloggers. So this is a blogger. It's like the, a blog of blogs. He will go out there and he'll give you the links to the 12 best for that day. So you don't have to spend hundreds of hours reading a lot of rubbish. Abnormal returns get you the best. Constantly look to it, upgrade yourself. Kzen, as the Japanese call it, continuous improvement. And finally, podcasts. I can't believe that these are given away for free. Two hours a day of these I am on. Invest like the best. Patrick O'Shaughnessy, the, the son of James O'Shaughnessy, one up on Wall Street. He gets the best investors the world's ever seen and he interviews them for an hour and they tell you about their process. And this is free. Masters in business, Barry Riddles gets similarly high, high caliber investors. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. You learn more from these giants through this than you will ever learn in a classroom. Please do embrace it. And Medfaber is very, very good on the more quantitative sides, but it's just, it's holding out your investment process. It's creating this intuition, what to look for and what, what you should avoid. Finish up, spoke about the process. Without a proper execution, the process is impotent. Invert common perception. 
go where others can't or won't look to take that side of the bet. A few investment factors, you only need four or five, get them right, that will drive your return. Don't agonize over trying to finesse it too much. Constantly challenge your ideas. If you're not changing your ideas at least once or twice a year on a stock, you're not thinking about them enough. And the truly exceptional companies are out there, but they are very, very rare, but it is definitely worth spending the time trying to identify them. Think about competitive advantage, but be aware of that pricing power. It is finite. Are they for the customer or are they extracting value from the customer? Where it's a parasitic relationship, avoid them. So thank you for that time. Bit of a whistle stop tour through it. I can go on for 10 hours plus, but when I would invite any questions, please, unless there's stunned silence. Um, thanks for the very, very, very interesting talk. Um, the government's talking about possibly reducing the AIM benefits for inheritance tax. Uh, if that happens, what's that likely to do to your portfolio and to AIM shares in general? Are they? Oh, Christ, I've got to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brilliant question. It's something I, I'm very cognizant of. The, there was a patient capital review recently that looked into it and it gave it a uh, green tick. They realized that growth capital is very important. SMEs are grist to the mill for the economy. They create far more jobs and generate a lot more tax than they cost in terms of the IHT saving. I've got a slight issue with companies or strategies or fund houses, the big boys in particular, where you've parked, say, James Holstead, a wonderful company, never needed to raise any capital, that's stale money. Whereas I, I do like participating in IPOs and secondary fundraisers, and that's what it should be more about. I deliberately have made my portfolio different to pretty much everyone else like out there. So if we do get a rule change, some stocks are very, very pregnant with IHT, and they'll be down 30 or 50% at the open. Most of my stocks don't have any other IHT investors on the register in any way in any sort of size, they might go down 10%, but then you'll get the long only institutional fund managers come in and bid them back up again. So I think it's a problem for the more stale stocks, for those that are managing tremendous amounts of money and they have to park it in the biggest stocks. I think the government should look at that. That's not really what this should be about. If they want to encourage investment, it should be growth capital to fund CapEx and jobs creation. But it is a risk with this and definitely never buy anything just for the tax. It has to stand up on its own merit um, or avoid it entirely. Hopefully my process does make it stand up, but I am concerned. The valuations at the high end of AIM, I can't add up. I think there's a bubble. I think it's a disaster waiting to happen. And thankfully I'm not in it, it's not my problem. Thanks for your time.